welcome everybody to uh, the afternoon session today. So uh, before really starting it, uh, we wanted to say one word about this new journal who came up. So uh, as you might have seen in the um, in the schedule, uh, in the in the afternoons we will soon uh, often have uh, research talks, and uh, one of the points we would like to emphasize is a uh, formalized mathematics something that can really build up a research project. This is, this is not uh, just for fun. You can <laughs> really uh, make uh, formalized mathematics being your uh, research topic or uh, this is something that uh, deserves, in a sense, this, this um, status. And uh, there is this new journal who has seen uh, the light of the day on Friday, so it is four days old. Uh, the <laughs> that, uh, well, it's especially done for this. So the point of this journal is to uh, receive submissions about formalized mathematics, especially uh, aiming at mathematicians. There are already journals uh, specializing in this kind of, of software or, or uh, conferences, proceedings, but uh, what is what will be novel about this journal is it really aims at a mathematical audience. Uh, two important things I'd like to say, first of all, uh, it is a complete diamond open access journal, so it is free for authors and for uh, for readers. Uh, and it is an overlay journal in the sense that uh, the principle uh, is that you should submit your preprint to uh, HAL or Archive or Zenodo, and then from there you can upload it. Oops. You can upload it to um, the website and having it scrutinized and, and uh, checked and reviewed by uh, the editorial board. And uh, speaking about the editorial board, this is uh, what I wanted to show you. So these are, uh, we have a bunch of amazing people in the scientific advisory board and a bunch of amazing people in the editorial board. And we are lucky enough to have one member of the editorial board here, which is Asia. And I'm going to uh, let her say a couple of words about the journal. Thank you. So, um, uh, as uh, Filippo said, this is a really a brand new journal, so it's uh, um, your decision what it will become. So, that the journal will become what you submit this journal to. And we would like to encourage you strongly to submit your best texts about uh, formalized mathematics. Um, and do not hesitate to uh, contact one of the members of uh, either scientific advisory board, sorry, or editorial board if you have any questions about the uh, relevance, expected scope. There is already a bunch of information on the website. You can have a look at uh, the aims and scopes webpage, for, them, for instance, to have um, a bit um, uh, information about the um, intention, at least, of the founders. Um, the uh, scientific uh, editorial board is composed of uh, different people coming from different backgrounds, um, different backgrounds also in the kind of software they're used to um, uh, formalized mathematics in. So really uh, all of this is about diverse, very diverse experiments um, of formalized mathematics. So uh, please do not hesitate to submit. We're very um, much uh, looking forward to your, your texts. And uh, I will now uh, switch to um, the next session of this conference and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our first uh, speaker of research talks. Uh, Sam van Gogh from uh, Paris City University, yep. <laughs> who will talk about uh, stone duality. So, hello everyone, and first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak here um, at Lean for the Curious Mathematician, or note that in French it's called Lean pour Mathematicien. This is of course because French mathematicians are all curious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> by, uh, by no means, I'm a, I'm a formalization expert, okay? I should say that I started uh, a few years ago by some motivations that I will show you in this talk. Um, and uh, I now have some limited experience in formalization, but uh, I would call myself more of an enthusiastic experimenter, okay? Um, uh, so that's for the disclaimers. So. Um, also, I like it when, uh, this is always strange to say, but when, when uh, I give a talk that, you know, some information actually comes across. <laughs> so, so don't hesitate to interrupt me or ask questions during the talk. There will be a little bit of time at the end, but 
it's better that you stop me and say, what, what are you saying? I don't understand, okay? Um, and I'll try to answer. Um, so the idea of my talk, let's see. I wanted to give you um, a mathematical overview of my field, stone duality theory, but also to invite you to collaborate on the formalization. So if you want, this is like a ex very extended presentation of possible projects <laughs> that you could do uh, with, with me, with us this week. I've already been working uh, with Filippo uh, a bit on formalizing some things that I'll talk about here. Uh, also, the slides are already online, so if you want to somehow look around, you can look in the Stone Duality folder. There's a link to the slides and there's a file that I'll use in a moment. But don't hesitate to sometimes look up for your, from your computer. Okay, don't forget. <laughs> so, um, the plan uh, first is to give, I um, apologize for those of you who know this stuff very well, but to kind of set the stage, first a little bit about topology and uh, in particular uh, frames, and then uh, I will go into the duality stuff and some um, formalization ideas and what has been done, etc. So first, very basic, what is a topological space? Well, I don't know, but uh, a point of a topological space, in any case, determines a collection of open neighborhoods, which here, for reasons that will become apparent later, I'll call epsilon of x, the collection of open sets containing a point x. And the way I want to think for this talk is that this is a kind of mapping of a topological space to its double dual, as you're maybe more used to, uh, let's say, for um, vector spaces. Okay, but this is kind of the same spirit. Uh, okay. I can say that, but you may ask me, well, what does it mean? What is the dual of a topological space? It's surely not a topological space, right? So what is it? And um, I will consider two possible answers. There are many more, but for this talk, uh, I will discuss two possible closely related answers to this question. The first is that the dual of a topological space is what one may call a frame, okay? A frame is defined as a complete lattice with an additional property. So complete lattice means a partial order where any subset has a supremum and an infimum. Actually, you only need to assume one of the two. I have to put that on my slide, otherwise someone will ask. <laughs> okay, you only, need to, you only need one of the two, then you get the other one, exercise. So what's a frame? A frame is such a complete lattice with this law, okay? So uh, in words, finite meets distribute over arbitrary joints. Meet means supremum, join, no, meet means infimum, join means supremum, okay? So if you squint your eyes and you think that this is just intersections and unions, okay, then it's a very familiar and true law. Okay, um, so what are frames? Of course, the open sets of a space with unions and intersections, but also maybe a little bit more uh, surprising or different is if you have a ring, commutative unital, then the radical ideals of that ring, okay, also form a frame. And we'll see why, okay, uh, they are the frame of opens of the Zariski spectrum of the ring. Uh, an even different example, you don't have to take all the open sets, you can, for example, take only the regular open sets, the ones with the property that, the that they're equal to the interior of their closure, okay? And that will form a frame, at least if you start with a compact Hausdorff space. And here I gave this example so that you can see that you have to do something a bit different sometimes than taking just union, okay? You need to take a union and then regularize to get a frame. Otherwise, it doesn't work. The union may, not, may fail to be regular again otherwise. <clears throat> okay, a frame, a frame homomorphism. It's just a function preserving the structure of a frame. And a continuous map between topological spaces will always give you a frame homomorphism in the opposite direction. So this opposite direction is uh, uh, what's called dual. So that's where the word duality uh, comes in. And if you think categorically, what we have defined is just a functor from the category of topological spaces to the opposite of the category of frames. Um, note that some people and some formalization libraries uh, call objects of frame op and uh, locales, okay? 
why not? Um, for me, I'll just keep writing frame up because it might confuse you, but some people call frame up lock for locales. Why not? Okay, so um, the first question, so here I just gave you a functor, but the first question you can ask is, well, do I lose some information, right? So no, you can just invert this functor. So you can reconstruct the space X if you only remember the frame L. Uh, and that's what you do, in fact, with this function uh, epsilon. Okay, you can't always do it. We'll see now exactly when you can do it. So if you think about it, the function epsilon that I had on my first slide gives a way to interpret points of X as subsets of the frame of opens. More precisely, so you may have heard already um, in the project announcement, someone mentioned that, oh, you can do topology with filters. So one of the reasons is this, that epsilon x is always what is called a completely prime filter of the frame of opens. I will give you the definition in a minute. So then familiar properties of spaces become properties of frames. For example, the uh, function epsilon will be injective if and only if the space is T0. In fact, this is more or less the definition of being T0, yes? Then when is epsilon surjective onto the completely prime filters? This is a little bit maybe less familiar definition, but in topology it's quite well known. This is called quasi-sober spaces. Why quasi-sober? Because the two together are called sober. And this was, in fact, the initial definition. Epsilon is a bijection if and only if the space that you took it from was T0 and quasi-sober. This is then called sober. You could take it to be the definition if you want. Okay, so it means that the space X can be entirely recovered from just knowing its frame of open sets. And sober spaces are exactly those which can be recovered from their frame of open sets. If you're worried about generality, any Hausdorff space is sober, okay? So that includes a lot of spaces. Any yes, also any spectral space. So we, I will come to spectral spaces in a minute, yeah? Um, okay. So um, I'll uh, take stock now. Um, uh, so uh, I, have, uh, I have defined a functor from topological spaces to, the, to opposite of frames and a way to recover it. And we're not completely done with duality because now you can ask a few natural questions. Okay, you gave me the set of points, but what about the topology on X? Did you forget about that or can you recover it? Um, can you recover... Uh, continuous maps between topological spaces from what you have on the side of frames. And in fact, can this be any frame? Is it more general frames or is, is, it just a, is it just a different way of viewing topological spaces? Of course, you can feel maybe that the answer to three is no. And that's for some reason why people at some point wanted to look at frames because it's a generalization of topological spaces. Okay. Um, Okay, so how, first question one, how do you recover the topology on the space X? Um, any questions until here? Okay, so um, how to recover the topology on X? So uh, now imagine that we have this frame and we want to recover the space. So, uh, a homomorphism, I, I will call, and this is just a name, okay, a point of the frame, I will call a homomorphism to the two element set uh, frame. You have a frame of two elements, which is the open sets of the one point space. Okay, some people, I call it two, some people call it one, that's the same people who uh, think of uh, locales instead of frames. Um, so, uh, that's called a point, okay? A point is like a character, okay? In uh, maybe in the theories that you know, like a, a point of the dual, if it was about vector spaces. It's analogous to that. So um, what is a completely prime filter that I mentioned already? It's basically any, uh, sorry, that should be a one. This should be a one. This here, this should be a one. 
Uh, it's any set that can occur as the co-kernel of a, of a point, <coughs> okay? So if you then can spell out the definition what that means, yeah, it's a set of open sets with the property that if you decide to put two open sets in there, uh, their intersection has to be in there. And if you decide to put a big union of open sets in there, you are forced to put one of them in there. That's what the conditions of being a frame homomorphism to two actually say, if you write them out. Okay, so that's the idea of a completely prime filter. Um, and we can recover the topology. So this is where it maybe gets a little bit twisted. So you now have a frame L, it's abstractly given. You have the set of points of that frame, okay? And you can define a topology on that set. So how do you do that? You say, well, uh, it's just like the definition of a topology. Uh, well, it's a definition of a topology on a set of kind of characteristic functions. So given an element of L, which we should think is an open set, even if we don't know it yet, we say the points in that open set are the ones that send this open set to one. It's a little bit uh, subtle, maybe if this is the first time you see this definition, but uh, it's what works. And then uh, you can also treat frame homomorphisms. So any frame homomorphism by actually just a general category theory will give you a dual function between the spaces, okay? Given a point, which is a thing from M to two, and given a um, homomorphism of frames L, okay, I also get by composing a point of the frame L. Yeah, so that's, you see again, the duality. Um, and it's not hard to prove that this function is continuous. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, some examples. So, if you've seen uh, irreducible closed sets, okay, in the definition maybe of sobriety, this is the same thing as a point of the frame of opens, okay? So, a point of the frame of opens is a homomorphism to two, and then this formula here on the right will give you a closed set, okay? And again, this should have been a one, sorry about that. Um, it gives you a closed set corresponding to that point, okay? And then the condition of sobriety tells you that irreducible closed sets are exactly uh, the singletons. Um, as mentioned, so points of this frame of radical ideals, that's a way, maybe a bit non-standard way, to define the Zariski spectrum, okay, of a ring. That's just what it is. Here is the formula. Now, what about my third example? So this is where you see that it's a bit more general. The regular open sets of a space may not have any points. So it's a frame. It's a frame without <coughs> points, okay? Even, uh, even the regular open sets of the unit interval zero, one. In fact, this is an example of a, of a Boolean frame, and a Boolean frame will always give you um, if you have a point, it should be an atom. You can easily show that this doesn't have any atoms. Okay. That's a little proof. It doesn't play a role in the rest of the talk. So what I wanted to arrive at as a first uh, point is this adjunction. Okay, so we have an adjunction between topological spaces and locales, the opposite of frames. And the maps epsilon and eta that I showed to you, okay, the open neighborhood map and the eta, they are in fact the unit and co-unit of this adjunction. And this fact is in MATLAB. So we started, uh, so this first part of the talk I presented last year at the workshop and immediately some uh, very strong lean hackers helped me to like put it in, put it in lean and then it may look like a long time. Well, first of all, for a mathematician, this is a great turnaround, right? That you have it published in three months, it's nice. <laughs> Four or five months. But second, uh, it's mostly because I wasn't working on it in the summer, okay? So we had, the, we had the pull request and then it took a few more months. So if you ever, I encourage you to try, okay? It's funny to, uh, to, to just experiment with that. You, 
you submit something to MATLAB and then eventually, so here it is, it eventually just shows up in the documentation. And just to show you, it, sorry? It's nice, yeah, it's like, uh, it feels like you've done something. I mean, even if it's like a thing that was known since the 1950s. <clears throat> um, no, no, but there's some, there's some uh, I'll come to some remarks about methodology. But um, so here is the, okay, so the thing I was calling O, it's called top to local. And the thing that I was calling PT is called PT, local.pt, okay? And this little symbol means a junction. If you then go, so, this is what the pull request looks like. So for those of you, this is a bit for those of you who've never seen that, okay? It's like something on GitHub, it's a website, you go there, you can have like a whole history of everything that was changed. So, you know, uh, last sorry, prove last sorry, the different icons are different people who worked on it. So you have a whole trace. Then some people start reviewing, okay? So, I don't know, Eric said something. This is all public, okay? You can, uh, and, and it's nice. <laughs> it's a nice way of working. Very different from what you're used to if you're used to writing mathematical papers. It's not there. We did a tutorial about ah. hit and pull requests tonight after dinner. Ah, great. Well, there you go. So I don't spend more time on that, but voila. And that's it. Oh, yeah, I wanted to show you what the actual files look like. Let's see if this will load. Um, so it's about 200 lines of code that was added in total, or no, less even, and, um, and collaborated on. And okay, the first time you write a proof, it doesn't look like this, it's a big thing. And then some real experts come and they tell you, oh, you can do this much, much shorter and much, much better and in MATLAB style, etc. But already what's a very nice step, I think, for me to get to is to eliminate all the sorry statements, okay? And then people tell you, oh, you should have done a different proof. It's okay, <laughs> right? It's like, uh... okay, so that was my first experience with formalization in MATLAB. I'm, um, okay, and now I'm coming to the first kind of series of projects of things that aren't done, okay? But that I would like that we could do. So, um, I explained to you just now that this function epsilon is bijective if and only if x is sober, and in fact, then it will be a homeomorphism, okay? It, it then automatically preserves the topology. Uh, what about eta? So, uh, almost by definition, this function is surjective, because that's how we put the topology on the space of points, okay? And one way to say that uh, it is injective is to say that the frame is spatial, okay? So that's a name. You can write out what it means, okay? Uh, but it means this. And then uh, the theorem really, okay, Stone didn't formulate it, but this kind of a precursor of it, and it was maybe for the first time really formulated by Strauss in the 50s, is that this adjunction in fact gives you an equivalence of categories between sober spaces and spatial frames, okay? So that's not yet stated in MATLAB, but I, I think it's really feasible to, to get from what there is already. <clears throat> okay, that's the first part on frames, uh, on frames. And now I'm going to go to a slightly different related answer to this problem of how to, uh, what is the dual of a topological space? And that will lead us to profinite sets and the notion of coherence. Okay. So let's first, before going to pro-finite, let's understand what I just did. Finite, okay? Finite topological spaces. Finite T0 topological spaces, okay. Then you get a an, very simple theorem. So a finite frame is sometimes called also a finite distributive lattice, okay? It's exactly the same thing. Distributive lattice in general means that you have the same law, but only for finite joins and meets, but if the structure itself is finite, it means the same thing. So then um, this duality that we just discussed gives you something much more simple, okay? Uh, the topological space in this case is just a, f uh, because it's finite and T0, it's just a partially ordered set, okay? And then the topology is the upper sets of that finite partially ordered set. So this is where the P comes from. 
And then the finite distributive lattice L will be the topology of that finite partially ordered set. Okay, so that's a really degenerate case of this more general duality that I showed you, and this was known before in work of Birkhoff. Ah, and also monotone functions between these post sets are in bijection with complete lattice uh, homomorphisms between the uh, corresponding lattices or frames. Okay, so this uh, <laughs> this is kind of surprising maybe that like sometimes if you start restricting things to finite and you want them very concrete in math, in in formalization it can make things a little bit harder to do. So we started doing that. So in fact. Uh, Yael Dillis had already done a good chunk of this and recently Filippo and I uh, improved a little bit. So this is almost <laughs> in MATLAB, but also not quite. And I think it's good to try to finish it um, because, okay, so now we move from the finite to the pro-finite and I'm going to first do that on the uh, side of the frames where it's called Boolean algebras. So I assume maybe you've heard somewhere what a Boolean algebra is. If you're an algebraist, you can think it's a ring where all elements are idempotent. Okay. If you think in terms of this talk, it's that it's a distributive lattice, okay, which I defined for you, where moreover each element is complemented. Okay. It takes a little bit of work, which I think is even formalized in MATLAB, to go between the two presentations of the concept. Okay. So what you would think of as ring product is the meat, and what you would think of as ring sum would be disjoint union. So. Okay, and then of course you can also specialize Birkhoff's theorem to just Boolean algebras, and it just says that a finite Boolean algebra is a power set. Okay. Um, but now Stone's really fundamental idea was that you can still do this even for infinite Boolean algebras which are more complicated. Okay, So any Boolean algebra in fact still embeds into a power set where x is precisely the set of points of B but there is a little detail here it's a different kind of point. Before I was speaking about frame homomorphisms okay now I cannot do that because I don't assume that my Boolean algebra is complete. It's not necessarily a frame. A frame had to admit all joints. This is where there is a little change. And so here I'm also looking just at lattice homomorphisms. Okay, so just preserving the, uh, this, the join, the meet, and then necessarily also the complement operation. And moreover, you can define a topology on this space again. So it's a slightly different kind of topology than what we saw before. It's in a way a much nicer or much, yeah, it's a compact Hausdorff and zero dimensional topology. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is what I pointed out. So any point of B viewed as a frame, if it is a frame, will be a lattice homomorphism, but not the reverse. Okay. Uh, in fact, I will come to this, but Stone, what is less well known is that Stone already proved a theorem also for distributive lattices, okay? Infinite distributive lattices. We will come to that um, in the same work, essentially. So what are profinite sets, which have recently kind of seen some revival in attention um, in mathematics? One way to see them is that they are a more modern, more categorical view on Stone's dual spaces uh, for Boolean algebras, these compact Hausdorff zero dimensional spaces. So to be a bit more precise, if um, I have a set S, I can look at its topological space, DS, the discrete space, and a profinite set is by definition, I would say, any topological space that can be obtained as a co-filtered or projective limit of discrete finite spaces. Okay, so you start from discrete finite spaces, you take all possible projective limits, which are sometimes called co-filtered. <clears throat> yeah, and this is the same thing as Stone's definition. Okay, so profinite set is the same as compact Hausdorff zero dimensional, is also the same as compact, and you have a strong separate a very strong separation axiom. Distinct points can be separated not just by disjoint open sets, but by disjoint closed and open sets. Okay. 
Uh, now, okay, so what's kind of interesting experience if you start formalizing, <coughs> someone who I think Anatol, who was presenting his project, said, yeah, this and this, but this definition is kind of wrong in MATLAB. And this is an experience that you might often have. So this is what happened to me when I saw the definition of profinite type. Okay, it's nobody's fault, but different mathematicians who formalize, like necessarily have different notions of what is the fundamental definition. And there's some work to do then to like link up all these definitions that you know to be equivalent. And sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's actually deep. Here, I don't think it's very hard. So um, the category of profinite types, okay, same thing as profinite sets, um, has a note, at least it did yesterday, because one thing to note also is that these things change super quickly. So yesterday it said, implementation notes, a profinite type is defined to be a topological space which is compact Hausdorff and totally disconnected. So zero dimension, yeah. So, that's not what you would write in a book, in a book because the name profinite is like the projective limit of finite spaces, right? But okay, to do, uh, and this is essentially, I think what is meant here, part of what is meant here is that you want to prove that it really means it's the projective completion of finite sets. There is some work to do on this interface. I just put that here. This is maybe more a remark for more advanced lean users, but also if you're not, uh, I had a lot of trouble in the beginning understanding when people started saying API, <laughs> it's like, what is that? So uh, what, what I have come to understand is that it kind of means that if you have two math books, okay, they might have two different definitions of the same concept that are even both called profinite set, but the definitions might look different. Then on a piece of paper somewhere, you, you prove that in fact, they are the same and you make some glue, which allows you to then use results from both books. Okay, and that's kind of what this building an interface, okay, is somehow, my understanding, is somehow trying to do, like an abstract way to say, oh, I can use these results if I view a profinite set like that, and I can use these results if I view a profinite set like that. No objections. <clears throat> okay, so then, um, uh, what would be great, but what I think is ambitious, is to formalize a proof um, that the following categories are equivalent. So, um, compact totally separated topological spaces, uh, projective limits of finite sets, and then a few, a few others, okay? Um, and I made some notes, I'll skip over this a bit quickly, it might be useful. I, I looked a while ago what is already in MATLAB and what is not already in MATLAB. So if you want to work on this, you can maybe um, refer to this slide. So one thing to note is that I refer here to some projects that other people did, which aren't fully in MATLAB. Okay, so there are some projects around that were done. They're not completely integrated in MATLAB, but they can be very useful to look and get ideas and even just uh, transfer some code, okay? Okay, so then why do, do we want all these equivalent definitions? If you have enough equivalent definitions, a lot of theorems become very easy, okay? So for example, stone duality then becomes almost a triviality. So it's a little sequence of equivalences of categories given that you know that you can present profinite sets in all kinds of different ways. But uh, I kind of put this here for illustrative purposes. This is already, this would already be a lot of the work, okay, to get to that thing I was calling first milestone, all these equivalent definitions. So for now, we don't have it. So, and there was some urgency or a challenge because a month ago, Filippo noticed that someone um, Dagor Askerson, who is formalizing stuff about light profinite sets, um, put in a recent pull request to MATLAB project, proof the stone duality theorem that profinite is equivalent to the opposite category of Boolean algebras. Of course, anyone hopes to see <laughs> that kind of request about their own domain, right? <laughs> like, oh, someone needs my theorem. <laughs> not my theorem, but okay. Then the property of being light says precisely that the corresponding Boolean algebra is countable. Okay, the details don't matter, but the idea is that if there was a formalized proof of stone duality for Boolean algebras, it would make some work 
that somebody else wanted to do easier. Okay, so it gave us a little motivation to um, to put it in uh, to put it in uh, Lean. So we thought, well, what can we do? There must be a book where <laughs> where <laughs> Philippe was laughing is ruining the joke, but we must look at a book where we can see how how it's proved. And fortunately, there was such a book. So we recently wrote a <laughs> sorry, but we recently wrote a wrote a textbook. So you can you can have a look. And um, in fact, the proof was way too complicated. Okay. So the point is that um, here we tried in this book to like teach in a pedagogical way, explain with a lot of examples, but it's not where we try to get to that specific theorem as soon as possible. As I'm sure you know, if you've tried to do some expository writing, you try to kind of, you know, build up to the, build up to the result in a nice and coherent way. Uh, so that's not what we want for, for formalizing one theorem in MATLAB. You just want one proof of the thing you're trying to show, okay, and nothing else. So instead, we just wrote, uh, where is that? I think I don't have it open. So I just wrote, like, I extracted from what we have in the book, okay, um, a very detailed proof. So if you start, the only purpose of this, don't try to understand it. The only purpose is to have like a line by line checkable proof, okay? So it has a lot of very detailed things subdivided in many lemmas that I wouldn't be inclined to write, but it's kind of a useful document to have if you start formalizing things. So it has kind of a lot of statements that almost look like tautologies, but this was the basis the kind of blueprint for what we then started formalizing in Lean. Um, so one way I like to read such files, so this is really very much work in progress, and I very much invite anyone who finds it interesting to work with us on that. So that is work I've been doing with Filippo, Filippo and Dagur, um, to start reading the file at the end, because that's the goal, okay? So in here you see, sorry, so this is not done. But we have some stuff, so we're trying to prove that profinite and Boolean algebras up are equivalent. And um, we have definitions of the functor and what should be its inverse, but we haven't yet proved that the unit, the co-unit, are isomorphisms and I suppose the triangle inequality. Yeah, the natural, oh no, the fact that they are each other's inverse, yeah. So, um, uh, what else to say about this file? Okay, so you can see the, you can look at the definitions. This file is in the Lean for the Curious Mathematician repository, um, but it's far from finished. And one thing I wanted to show you is what I worked on recently. Yeah, this is absolutely not the right MathLib. This is like not exemplary MathLib code at all, but it's just to show you that you can start writing a bit naively what you know to be true. <laughs> and you can follow your nose and prove something. So here, if you just read the text, if I have a, t a Hausdorff space and it has a continuous binary operation, okay, and on a set X, I also have a binary operation, then the set of functions from X to Y that preserve the operation is a closed subspace of the power. So if I maybe write it a little bit more in usual mathematical notation, it's something like y is a t2 space, and I'm interested in a subspace of y to the x, okay, where y and x are both equipped with some multiplication, you can think, okay, and I'm looking at the set of those f which preserve the multiplication. Oops. And you see I'm using, you can see here that I'm using something from the library, namely that the diagonal of y is closed, okay? And then I do something with inverse image and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then uh, Daguerre did a lot of work also on the rest. Voila. Oh. Okay, um, yeah, so that's a project also to help us fill in the sorries in that file. Um, a, a, remark, a methodological remark, um, 
uh, it can feel a bit strange, at least to me it feels a bit strange to put a lot of sorries in files because it's the opposite of what you're taught to do as a mathematician. You have to prove things. But in a way, to like uh, sketch out how it's going, I find it very useful. So I start with the final statement where I'm going. I put a lot of sorries and then you kind of work back because you then see like, oh, what do you need here? What do you need there? And oh, if I want to fill this sorry, I'm going to create another sorry. And then you hope, of course, one day you will come back and fill out all these sorries, right? But, um, or better, you have some really fast co-authors. I had to like kind of tell Dagger, like, don't, <laughs> don't finish the file. <laughs> we won't have anything to do. But no, there will be something to do. So this. It's the state of the art right now, but okay. Then maybe, um, yeah, so then assuming that we can do that together, um, I mentioned that uh, Stone did much more than Boolean algebras. So um, this last part of the talk, I will work uh, towards um, actually explaining to you some results that I formalized earlier with other co-authors in Cook. okay? So, um, stone duality for, uh, for distributive lattices um, looks a lot like the one for Boolean algebras, okay? Except now we're not working with finite discrete spaces, but with finite T0 spaces. And again, the way to derive this easily, given something like this milestone that I told you earlier, is to notice that here, finite T0 spaces by Birkhoff's theorem is the same as finite distributive lattices. Distributive lattices is the incompletion of finite distributive lattices. And well, that must then be dual to the pro-completion of finite T0 spaces, the end, okay? But that's a very, that's the kind of high level abstract proof that is nice to give on paper, but I don't know yet how to formalize. And also there's mathematically something slightly not so sat not satisfying unsatisfactory about this is that what is this pro-completion of fin t0? That's a very abstract uh, category. Like I don't know what to do with objects of the pro-completion of finite t0 spaces. So fortunately already Stone realized that you can write this in a much more concrete way and it's an interesting category. It's the category of compact sober spaces which have a basis of compact open sets closed under finite intersections. So this is completely analogous to compact Hausdorff zero dimensional spaces, except you relax the notion of Hausdorff and you realize that compact and closed is no longer the same thing. Okay. Uh, you can characterize this property also in terms of uh, the corresponding frame. And here there are some connections with algebraic geometry that I don't know much about. Um, but the frame is then called coherent, okay? So a space is spectral if and only if the corresponding frame of open sets is coherent. And here is the abstract definition, uh, which I don't need to go through uh, for the purpose of this talk. So what are spectral spaces? Of course, finite T0 spaces. There's a risky spectrum of any ring. So remember, I told you that for uh, the frame, it was all the radical ideals. Now the corresponding distributive lattice is just the finitely generated radical ideals. So you will often see this mechanism if you move between distributive lattices and frames, it's like moving between the infinitary, the all ideals and only the finitary objects. Um, okay, there's, um, to make this precise, it's even the case that every spectral space is the Zariski spectrum of some ring. Okay, so it goes also in the opposite direction. Uh, the proof is, is hard, <laughs> okay? I wouldn't try to formalize that. Even um, the fact that it works for finite distributive lattices, I, it's like, okay, you can, find, you can find it and read it in books, but I think it would be a more um, costaud uh, <laughs> formalization project. <laughs> No, so this is, a, I think, a, a research question. Well, you can kind of artificially impose structure on the spectral space, like making it into a ringed space so that it becomes okay. an equivalence, but uh, there's not a natural, as far as I can tell. For instance, um, 
what do you take for the one point space? Can be any field. Uh, no, no, I mean, every, every spectral space is the Dirichlet spectral norm of some ring. Yeah. If, you have a, if you have a continuous function between spectral spaces, this does not come from a ring homomorphism in, in the other direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, this is just the object. Yeah, but you want to upgrade this to a... Uh, I mean, if you have a continuous function between spectral spaces, does this come like two points? <laughs> no, no, no. No. No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So another great thing... So, so, yeah, yeah, another great thing about, uh, about MATLAB and, and this kind of formalization practices in general is you get uh, discussions about math. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about math that you think, oh, I should know this. But, uh, you find out how little you know. Okay, so a spectral space is a projective limit of finitely zero spaces, but I think this relates, in fact, to your question. So something I do know is that, um, in fact, um, the morphisms in the category of spectral spaces are a bit subtle. Okay, so they are not the continuous ones the natural morphisms. So uh, a function between spectral spaces is called coherent if the inverse image of a compact open set is always compact open. Okay, and those are somehow the natural morphisms. And if you, if you impose that, you get a nice diagram. So a fairly nice diagram. So this is what we discussed more or less so far. You have Boolean algebras in profinite sets, which is a dual equivalence. You have distributive lattices and spectral spaces, but with coherent maps. And then um, this should be an arrow in the other direction, right? So a frame is in particular, so the arrows down here should be going up. A sorry about that. A frame is in particular a distributive uh, lattice. Okay, so, uh, okay, this definition of spectral space is one possibility, but um, it, the, you already saw it's a bit much to remember, or compact, sober. Uh, is there a nicer way to understand this? And so this was already done in the 70s, so one point that maybe you know if you did some non-Hausdorff topology is that um, it makes sense to look at the partial order of specialization on this space. So. Um, <coughs> um, X is below Y in the specialization order if Y is in the closure of X. Okay, of course on a T1 space this is just equality. Yeah, but um, Now um, you can take a spectral topology and invert it and create another spectral topology by or reverse it and the reverse or inverse topology has a, is also spectral and has the reverse specialization order. Um, and then you can take these two topologies and put them together into one topology. And why would you do such a thing? Because in fact, this will give you a compact Hausdorff space. Okay, so the, you have the upper topology, the lower topology of a given space, but you put them together, you get a compact Hausdorff space, which moreover then has a specific property regarding the specialization order. If you think that the spe specialization order is trivial, this just says distinct points can be separated by a clopen set. Okay, we recover the usual definition of stone that I presented to you, but here it's an ordered version of that definition. Okay, so if X is not below Y, sorry, this should have been uh, not more special, then there is a clopen upper set containing X and not Y. Okay, so if you have not this, then you can put a clopen upper set around X that doesn't contain Y. So uh, this is such a space is now called a Priestley space, okay, after Hilary Priestley. And 
You can recover the spectral topology from the Priestley space by taking the open upper sets. And in fact, this is exactly the same category. Okay, it's just a nicer presentation of it. So spectral spaces with coherent maps is the same thing as Priestley spaces, but now with continuous monotone maps. So the, the way of viewing the functions is a little bit um, more natural, maybe. You don't have to come up with ad hoc inverse image of compact opens, okay? It's just continuous order preserving maps. <coughs> um, and I said this, so profinite sets are just the spectral spaces that are Hausdorff and they are the Priestley spaces where the order is trivial. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to show you this. So, um, Priestley spaces, therefore, is also the dual category of distributive lattices, okay? It's a corollary. It's just a different presentation of the same category. You can again work out what the functors are. And um, one interesting remark that kind of calls back to the stuff I told you about rings is that there is also a notion of ideal for lattices. And again, the open upper sets of the spectrum is the same as the ideals of the lattice now. Okay, so now I have a little bit of time left to show you uh, some work that I did in this field. So, um, I mean, non-formalization work. So this requires me to speak about heighting algebras. And heighting algebras are frames, okay? So, uh, not all heighting algebras, but you can think of frames. And any frame admits um, an operation that I define like this. Okay, this may look a bit mysterious, so I just give you the definition in the case where it's a frame of open sets, where uh, I write U implies V for a new open set, which is the interior of the complement of U union V. So it's kind of like a co-boundary uh, if you want, but also if you think logically, why is it written ex um, implication? Because it's the interior of a set with, uh, that you could define as if x is in u, then it is in v. Um, okay, so that's, uh, I said it wrong before. So a frame is always a heighting algebra, but not the converse. So um, a heighting algebra by definition is just a distributive lattice in which you can do, make this definition. Okay. And it was long known that um, you can view, you can use Priestley duality to characterize which distributive lattices are heighting algebras. It, this is then called an Ezekiah space. And okay, the interest of heighting algebras is that they are exactly the algebraic models of intuitionistic logic, uh, intuitionistic logic. And uh, there was a theorem that I won't have the time to recall, but just, um, uh, state here called uniform interpolation and with duality you can prove that in fact uniform interpolation is the same thing as an open mapping theorem between Ezekiel spaces. Okay, so um, yes. Uh, this then gives a proof of the uniform interpolation theorem for intuitionistic logic which if you have a little bit of categorical intuition just says that a homomorphism between heighting algebras always has left and right adjoints if the heighting algebras are finitely presented. And now why did we formalize this in Koch? Because in fact, this theorem was uh, long known, as you can see, the, the theorem by Pitts. And in fact, it had a very syntactic proof, okay? It really has a content that says you can compute something called a uniform interpolant, whatever that is. But anyone who you would ask, like, can you please compute this thing for me? Or can you compute it by hand? It was very difficult. Okay, it was really on small examples. It was already difficult to do. And then people wrote some programs in C, okay, which uh, they themselves said, yeah, but it has bugs, like it sometimes works, okay. So that's why we decided like, okay, we should just take this theorem and formalize it so that we have a guaranteed correct program. And moreover, recently, we then used it to also apply the same construction in slightly different contexts by kind of 
uh, using the fact that the code is very modular and you can change some assumptions around and you get um, new calculations. So one thing about the, so Kirk is a, is a different uh, proof assistant, soon to be renamed Rock, yes. And um, it lets you, actually one feature is that um, it lets you extract the code that you wrote in as a proof, okay, into different programming languages. For example, the programming language OCaml. So that's what we did. And then you can, as a kind of nice presentation, because not everybody knows how to use OCaml, you can um, make out of that a web application in JavaScript, for example. And that's what we did. So now, so this file that is linked in the slides contains the whole um, formalization, okay, it's long. And then um, here is a user facing thing and it won't work now because Yeah, so um, you can enter the things that you want to compute with and it outputs, in this case, fairly quickly uh, an answer. But if you give some slightly more convoluted example just to show you, okay, it will take a while longer. Yeah, this one is easy still. You can see that it starts getting quite big. So this is why it was maybe hard to compute by hand. And now let me launch this one. So now the ominous, the button stays gray, but okay, uh, it's thinking. Um, the point of this is that one use of all this formalized proving is also eventually maybe to actually get some programs that you know are correct, that can help you calculate things that interest you in mathematics, in my case, uniform interpolance in intuitionistic logic, but in your case, uh, maybe something else. Okay, I was hoping to like speak long enough that you can <laughs> see the thing appear, but <clears throat> um, what else did I want to see? Ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so that's why people couldn't compute it by hand. I don't claim that this is the simplest representation possible. It's still some work in progress to see if the formula could in fact be simplified but at least we know it's correct. Ah, when I say we know it's correct, we know that the cuck is correct. <laughs> then all these steps after of like extracting it to OCaml and then translating it to JavaScript, that depends on your own personal philosophy, how much you trust the people who wrote those programs, right? And if you really want to be very strict, you can of course install cuck and our library and just to execute the functions in Cook, if you want to be very certain, if you need it to build an airplane, for example. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just finish with a, with a quote from, uh, from Stone, uh, because I was interested preparing this talk, uh, where, wh what he actually had to say about his theorem. Perhaps the discovery of Stone duality and other things that have happened in the course of my research suggests that in many kinds of mathematical work, the key is asking the right questions. Once the question is posed, the answer becomes a matter of persistent analysis. Of course, the big unsolved problems for math theorem, it was 1976, Riemann hypothesis, etc., may provide counterexamples. Still, many problems seem to become easier when they can be twisted somehow into new forms, converting them into right questions. So I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. We have time for questions now. Yeah. So th thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, where are condensed spaces in all this picture? So condensed, uh, what I understand is that condensed Spaces are, let me get this right, sheaves on the category of profinite sets, yes. okay, valued in top. And so um, if you want to, so 
that's all I know about condensed spaces. Okay, so then Dagur, for example, tells me that he's because of certain things in the theory of condensed sets, he needs to know things about the category of profinite sets. And that's how we started doing that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's all I can say about that. Any other question? You can, so I have some uh, project ideas here. <laughs> Yeah. At some point you have this project. So at some point there were these projects linking different uh, presentations of profinite sets, right? Yes. And there you mentioned, was it lean liquid? What was that about? Yes. So this is about the fact that lean liquid was the liquid tensor experiment which was a big formalization effort that was done by a number of people a few years ago. And in their work, when I was looking at this, I noticed that they more or less proved that the pro-completion of the category fin set is the same as the category of compact totally separated topological spaces. They formalized uh, that fact. Um, but that fact is in a different GitHub repository that is not Matlib. So there is in three, in the end, it's in lean three. But so there is probably some work to do, maybe not the most expiring, inspiring to like get it in there. No, or what? Yeah, we can discuss it later. Okay, I, I wasn't. I just found. I looked it. I looked for it, and this is where I found it. And an lean solid. <laughs> uh, that's another one. So that is Dagur's uh, development. Yeah. Lean solid. That's over there. Yeah, so that is Dagur. What the, that was the library that Dagur was developing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. It's in Lean 4. But if you're interested in the Lean liquid, in the Lean tensor experiment, there are experts in this room. Yeah, not me. <laughs> no, no, I'm the leader of the Lean Tensor Ah, he's there. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> He was hiding behind his laptop. <laughs> Any other question, comments? Do you want to spend some time on your project lists? No, I mean, uh, it's more, it's just this project list is just a summary of things I, because I know I went through a lot, okay, it was a bit on purpose, so that maybe you are inspired by one of these things then feel free to talk to me and write on Zulip. We can make a little group if you want and we can work on that, on one of these things. But the slides are online, so you can look back. Okay. Okay, so maybe if there's no more comment, let's thanks the speaker again. Thank you.